right, everybody, welcome back to another OpenShift Commons briefing. And as we like to do on Mondays, we are going to have an Ask Me Anything question with one of the most wonderful upstream projects, um, Fedora CoreOS. We have a number of the members of the team um, from Fedora CoreOS, as well as a few of the OKD working group folks who are um, also leveraging Fedora CoreOS in a big way. Um, today we have Dusty Mabe, who's going to kick us off with a intro to Fedora CoreOS and a bit of a demo. And then after that, we'll do live Q&A. And we're streaming in Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube. So we'll aggregate all the questions and um, feed them to our lovely contestants today. So with that, Dusty, take it away. Hey, everybody. Thanks for the intro, Diane. Uh, so my name's Dusty Mabe. I work for Red Hat. And I'm here to talk about Fedora CoreOS today. Um, so briefly, I'm going to talk about what is Fedora CoreOS. I'm going to talk about some of the features of Fedora CoreOS, how it relates to RHEL CoreOS, and also uh, how does it relate to OKD. And then I'm going to give a short demo and hopefully dig into a lot of questions from people. Okay, so I, here I had planned to start the demo. Uh, the demo is actually an install of OKD on top of Fedora CoreOS, but I realized that the Install time would take longer than my talk, so I started it early today, so we'll get to that in just a little bit. Okay, Fedora CoreOS, what is it? It's an emerging Fedora edition. Uh, it came from the merging of two communities. One was CoreOS Inc.'s Container Linux community and also Project Atomic's Atomic Host community. Uh, it incorporates uh, the Container Linux philosophy, uh, or what we've been referring to as the Container Linux philosophy, uh, the provisioning stack and the cloud native expertise of Container Linux. Um, and it also incorporates uh, Atomic Host's Fedora Foundation, the update stack, and the enhanced security with SE Linux. Uh, so first, I want to talk a little bit more about the philosophy behind Container Linux um, because it really has driven what we've done with Fedora CoreOS. Uh, so first off, Container Linux focused primarily on automatic updates. Uh, which means that the administrator by default has no interaction with the system in order to keep the system up to date. Um, and the goal there is that staying up to date in a default automated manner uh, means that security fixes get automatically applied and your systems uh, stay more secure. So more secure by default. Um, Container Linux also had all nodes start from approximately the same starting point. Uh, and they used Ignition in order to achieve this goal. So you would use Ignition to provision a node wherever it started, whether it be on bare metal or on cloud, and they all essentially start from the same starting point. Um, Container Linux also focused on immutable infrastructure. So for example, if you need a change, um, you're encouraged to update your configuration and reprovision. Uh, this kind of guarantees that, uh, you know, your changes make it back into your uh, configuration and it's tested because guess what? You've tested that uh, provisioning when you brought up a new node. Also, uh, user software runs in containers, which means that applications don't depend on the host and they the host updates are more reliable. When you have automatic updates, you need them to be reliable. Um, so now we're going to talk about Fedora CoreOS, and you're going to hear a lot about that, uh, those features that I just mentioned or the philosophy I just mentioned. The first one being automatic updates. Uh, so Fedora CoreOS features automatic updates by default, and if you have automatic updates, you need them to be reliable. How do we achieve this goal? Uh, so we achieve this goal by having extensive tests in automated CI pipelines. Um, we also have several update streams, which I'll touch on in a minute, that allow users to preview what's coming. Uh, users run the various streams so that they can know when changes are coming that they need to either address or report issues for. Um, we also have managed upgrade rollouts. Uh, so upgrades, uh, you know, upgrade windows happen over several days. If people hit issues early in the rollout window, they report them and we can you know, address the issue, stop the rollout window if we need to. Um, and then of course, 
things will go wrong at some point. Um, for when things go wrong, we have RPM OS tree rollback, which can be used to go back to the previous version. And in the future, we plan to have some sort of automated rollback functionality where a user can specify, hey, if this particular health check doesn't pass, I want you to automatically go back to the previous version before this update. Um, that's a future feature, not something we have just yet. Okay, I mentioned multiple update streams. Right now we have three update streams which we offer uh, that have automatic updates. One is Next. Uh, that stream is focused more on experimental features or Fedora major release rebases. Uh, so for example, when we switch to Cgroups v2, right now we're on Cgroups v1 in Fedora Core OS. When we switch to Cgroups v2, we will land that in the next stream first. Uh, it will have some soak time there. Hopefully people report any issues, we get them fixed. And then eventually they'll go into testing and stable. Um, also, for example, when we switch from Fedora 32 to Fedora 33, that will happen in Next first. So it's an opportunity for us to uh, I, you know, put those breaking changes that are gonna happen or possibly breaking changes that are gonna happen in there and get them tested. Okay, so testing is basically a preview of what's coming to stable. It's a point in time snapshot of Fedora stable RPM content. Um, and that is going to go directly into stable in two weeks if we don't find issues. So the goals of having these update streams are to publish new releases into update streams every two weeks and also find issues and get them fixed so they don't hit the stable stream. Uh, the Fedora Core OS release promotion, I touched on this briefly. We have a version number that basically incorporates the Fedora Major, uh, the date at which content was snapshotted from Fedora stable repos, and then also a number that indicates which release stream we're on. So we have, uh, we have three release streams. Uh, we have testing, stable, and next, and that number corresponds to a release stream. And then we have a revision, so if we do an ad hoc fix to a content set, we will bump that revision number and re-release. So for the YUM repositories, if this represents the YUM repository moving um, in, in time, we will snapshot that on, in this case, uh, the third or the 23rd of March. That becomes the testing stream. We do a testing stream release. And then hopefully we don't find any issues. Two weeks later, that gets promoted to stable and people in the stable stream get that content. Okay, the next feature is automated provisioning. So Fedora Core OS uses Ignition to automate provisioning, just like Container Linux did. Uh, any logic for machine lifetime is encoded in the config, so it's very easy to automatically reprovision nodes. An example of this is earlier this year, um, I have a node sitting on my desk in the office that uh, runs Fedora Core OS, and it also happens to be a, an IRC client server setup that I have. Um, yet, I lost power to it at some point, and it didn't turn itself back on. So I wasn't able to get to it, and I also wasn't able to get into the office because of COVID. So I took the configs that I used to bring up that server, and I just spun up a VM at home, and I was back up and running in 10 minutes. So that's an example of, you know, because everything is, is baked into these ignition configs, uh, it's really easy to get a new node up and running in the same profile as the one that you had. Um, and then because we're using ignition, we have the same starting point, whether we're on bare metal or cloud, we use the approximately the same image everywhere. Um, so we, because we can use ignition everywhere as opposed to kickstart, for bare metal and cloud in it from cloud, it kind of unifies the whole experience. Okay, so the details of Ignition. Ignition is a declarative JSON document. Uh, it's machine friendly, so not very user friendly unless you like to read JSON. Um, it runs exactly once during the initRAMFS stage on boot. Uh, it can write files, system to units, users, groups, partition disks, etc. cetera. Um, the key point here is if provisioning fails, the boot fails. So you don't end up with a half provision system. Uh, sometimes with CloudInit, you could have part of it succeed and part of it not succeed, and then you've got an application up that's half running. 
Uh, with Ignition, you know, it's good because you know the machine didn't provision correctly, but it also can be bad because it's hard to debug in the init run FS. So there's good and bad there, but we like it overall. Um, particularly, uh, Ignition is not very human friendly, so we have a tool called the Fedora Core OS Config Transpiler that is a lot more human friendly. Uh, it's written in YAML, and it also has some what we call sugar on top that will automatically write out some of the more tedious parts of Ignition um, for you. So the next feature I'd like to talk about is basically cloud native and container focused. So software runs in containers um, and users have two options. They have Podman or Moby Engine, which is also known as Docker. Uh, those two container runtimes, if you're coming from container Linux, um, you still have Docker if you want to use that, or if you want to try out Podman, that's there for you. Um, it's ready for cluster deployments, so you can spin up 100 nodes and have them join a cluster. Uh, because ignition configs are used to automate the cluster join, it kind of take, takes care of everything for you. Um, and then you can spin down nodes and spin them up again as you need, so that's kind of more of the cloud native um, piece of it. It's also, also offered on a plethora of clouds and vert platforms, so we're trying to be on any major cloud platform and you know we're adding new ones every day. Uh, OS versioning and security. So this is one that I'll dig into a little bit. Um, Fedora Core OS uses RPM OS tree technology. I like to describe it as like Git for your operating system. So we have, uh, for example, a particular version of Fedora Core OS, which is kind of like a tag. Um, you have, a version and also a git commit, or sorry, uh, an OS tree commit hash. And this single identifier tells you all the software that's in a particular release. It tells you all the RPM content, tells you all the config um, default settings that are delivered. And that is important when you're trying to report issues or share information. So as a user, you can report an issue and say, hey, I'm on this specific commit of Fedora Core OS and I run these steps and I see this problem. Uh, and that's really powerful. Um, because it uses RPM OS tree, it also has read-only file system mounts, which prevents accidental OS corruption. So if you happen to RMRF on the wrong directory, uh, and it also prevents some, you know, novice attacks from modifying the system. Um, we also have SE Linux enforcing by default, which prevents compromised apps from gaining further access, uh, which is not something that Container Linux had. Okay, so what's in the OS? Uh, we have the latest Fedora base components built from RPMs. We have hardware support. So hopefully uh, anything that Fedora supports, uh, we can support with Fedora Core OS. We have basic administration tools. We have container engines and not much else. Um, so we don't have Python. The goal here is that we encourage users to run their applications in containers and not run things directly on the host. That makes our updates more reliable. Uh, we don't want to update the host and break your application. Okay, so coming soon, we have more cloud platforms um, that we're adding. We also are trying to get support for multi-arch. We've got more, uh, you know, human-friendly helper functions that we want to add to Fedora Core OS Config Transpiler. We want to make our package layering more reliable in cases that might need that. Um, we want to have more slash improved documentation and then also tighter integrations with OKD. Um, when you talk about Fedora and RHEL Core OS, you want to know what's the difference. Um, so at a high level, the biggest difference is obviously based on RHEL package set versus based on a Fedora package set. But uh, the probably the larger thing is Red Hat Core OS is only designed or meant to be used directly with OpenShift uh, itself and not meant to be used standalone. Um, so the updates for Red Hat Core OS are delivered and controlled by the cluster itself and not independently of the cluster. With Fedora Core OS, you can use it either standalone or you can use it as part of a cluster. So for example, with OKD, in the standalone case, you get the updates directly from Fedora Core OS's uh, release servers. In the case of OKD, you get the updates similar to how Red Hat Core OS gets its updates from containers in a registry. So you can use Fedora Core, Core OS uh, standalone with other cluster orchestration technologies or with OKD. Okay, specifically OKD, um, 
is installable with OKD's installer, so the same one that OCP uses, OpenShift install. Uh, the cluster controls the OS upgrades, as I mentioned a minute ago. Up upgrades are provided as machine OS content containers, and then the cluster can manage and bring up new machines automatically, which I think is the coolest point there right at the end. Okay, so let me go into demo. Diane, do we have any uh, questions before I go into demo? Do your demo first, and we'll queue up the questions afterwards. Because then Okay, I'll... perfect. Let me switch my screen share. See if this is the right one. Can you guys see my terminal window? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So I was going to start this at the beginning of the talk, but I realized that it takes uh, a little while, 35 minutes to bring up a cluster. So I started a while back. Um, so in this case, what I've done is I've brought up an OKD cluster running on Fedora Core OS, and I'll hop over here to another window, and I'll actually show that running. So I'm using a terminal uh, user interface called K9s, I guess, uh, which is pretty awesome. I like it a lot. Um, okay, so this is my cluster. Uh, in this case, I have one, two, three of our primary nodes and then two worker nodes. Um, one thing that's really nice is I can dig into each of our nodes and I can actually search Fedora Core OS and the cluster knows what operating system is running underneath, which I think is pretty darn cool. So this is uh, the Fedora Core OS release um, of Stable that we just released on Friday. It's from a content set uh, from June 29th. So that's when we froze uh, the content set, we did a testing release, and then we did a subsequent Stable release two weeks later. Okay, so this is the node, um, and I can dig into each node. I can see what's running on each node. Um, I think one of the coolest things that you can do with OKD these days, and it represents the tight integrations with the operating system, is if we go and we look at the machine sets for this particular cluster, I only brought up two worker nodes. So there's a third machine set here, which has no nodes currently in it. So if I go and I edit that particular machine set and I change the replicas to one, so it will start to bring up a node. And if I want to edit another one, I can bring up some even more nodes. So let's make this one two. And now I can go look at the machines in the cluster and we can see we have two that are provisioning right now. Um, Regarding OKD itself, as those predict provision, uh, you know, typically if you want to look at the health of the cluster, I look at the cluster operators, and these kind of uh, give you a sense of the health of the cluster. In this case, it looks like we have one cluster operator that is in a degraded mode, which is not good. So I'll need to look into that one. <laughs> but in general, as long as all of these typically say false, then you're good. Um, let's see, let's see if those, those haven't come up as nodes yet. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of, uh, the demo. Um, I can run OC debug node to get into any particular one of these machines if I want to. Um, but this is just kind of a representation of the integration with the OS that we have, um, with Fedora Core OS and OKD that makes things like this possible. I can I can scale out uh, a cluster, you know, depending on my workload. And because it uses Ignition to serve all of these new worker nodes, uh, essentially their role in the cluster, those come up automatically and join the cluster. And then, you know, that's the end of the story. So I think that's all for me, unless anybody wants me to poke around here and show anything else off. Someone, um, Jeff was asking, Maybe, uh, and this might be where, are you able to show off some of the features of your ignition config? Like a, a, a specific ignition config? Perhaps. Um, Let's see what I have. The one you use to bootstrap the cluster. Okay. Let's see if there's anything in here. 
don't know if I have those specific ignition configs, but And Christian is saying that those are um, typically created by the installers automatically. And I'm just going to unmute a few folks here so other people can chime in. Colin, Christian. Yep. Yep. So here I, I just uh, I just highlighted one ignition config in the terminal here, which is more or less um, the one that's used to bring up the bootstrap node, which is essentially what kicks off the the entire install of the cluster. Um, so this ignition config has some user information where it sets SSH keys. Uh, it writes in different registry configurations. Um, you know, it pretty much defines everything that needs to be set for this cluster in order for it to, you know, do everything it needs to do. So we've got CA information. Uh, we've got services that start. Uh, it's just a whole host of different things. Uh, does anybody know of a particular thing that might be good to show off? Well, one thing I would add to this. Um, so, you know, part of what came from CoS was container Linux, but also Tectonic. Like a lot of OpenShift 4 and OKD now is based on an evolution of Tectonic design. And so uh, for, for OpenShift 4, the ignition configs are actually cluster objects themselves, like uh, Dusty, if you want to do OC git machine config. So like as an addition to the CoreOS model, the, the, mach the integrated machine config operator will support day two changes. So uh, as was kind of mentioned, like the, the ignition is provided at install time. And so OpenShift and OKD work the same way as any other workload on top of Fedora CoreOS. But in, in addition to that, um, the MCO kind of takes over day two, and so you can create a machine config object with OK with OC, and that will that change will roll out to the cluster. Okay, someone is asking also, what happens when you create a machine config that breaks the host? For example, a mistake in the system D unit, will it automatically roll back? Yeah, I'll just echo what Vadim said. Basically, the, the MCO today only rolls out a change to one node at a time. So you can you can adjust that, and you may want to do that in larger clusters. But so if you you know create a system to unit file that breaks boot up, then only one node will go. So he's again asking, so the node will stay disabled for scheduling. Uh, yeah, yes. Yes. I mean, it depends where you break it. But yes. So from YouTube, someone's asking, what about support for hardware RAID controllers for bare metal servers like HP Gen 10 and Supermicro servers? Also VLAN and Bond support for network cards. Have we gone there yet? Dusty, so do you want should, to talk? Yeah, we should have support for, uh, you know, complex networking configurations. Anything that uh, Network Manager supports should be just fine. As far as the, um, did, they, did they say hardware RAID? Is that what you said? Hardware RAID, yep. Uh, so as far as hardware RAID goes, assuming that you don't need like a special driver in order to bring it up, then you know the hardware RAID just it shows uh, a disk to the OS, right? So like whatever, is configured in hardware RAID, it usually just shows a single device um, to the OS, so that should work. Is that specifically a question about like uh, like uh, modules and or drivers? Yeah, Vivian has not said that yet, so we'll, we'll see if she clarifies that. Okay, gotcha. We'll do that. Yeah, software RAID, a slightly different story. We're working on complex root device, um, you know, stuff. Uh, we're not quite there yet with uh, the root. Um, partition, at least. We're shipping a regular Fedora kernel in Fedora CoreOS and a regular RHEL kernel in RHEL CoreOS. So in terms of just strictly drivers, um, 
anything that works in those districts should work here. Good to know. Thanks. Um, Waleed asked a question, and I think it might have been answered in the chat. Would it be possible to report back to Red Hat Satellite Foreman for overall inventory security stand? Um, and he said it came to an internal audit for Rail Core West nodes were not part of the satellite host inventory. Yeah, I can take this one. So, you know, I think one of the, I can speak for all of OpenShift, but certainly a huge design point was that OpenShift and, and you know, OKD should be self-driving by default. Like it shouldn't require you to run external infrastructure to say spin up a cluster at AWS or GCP or public cloud. We definitely want to integrate with an external system. So I think the short answer to this would be, you can always run a daemon set or a systemd unit file that runs on each node that does, you know, a web request to foreman and asserts the, the machine health. I think that's probably the shortest answer. Um, but, you know, it's actually really interesting because the, the demo Dusty did of the machine API is actually the cluster itself. Like you can spin up new machines using OC. Like your user experience is, is OC to control the inventory of things. Oh. Right. One other question. Um, what is the proper way of accessing Fedora CoreOS when network is not working or the SSH private key gets lost, the pending single to the kernel parameter yeah. didn't work for him? So. Hmm. So I, I guess it depends on how long ago uh, this person tried that, because we did some work maybe a month ago or so uh, to make sure that a pending single to the kernel command line should drop you in appropriately to, uh, a, you know, admin shell or whatnot. So you should be able to set a password or change a um, an SSH key. Um, if they didn't set a password, maybe there was an SE Linux problem when they got into that shell, but I would say open a bug <laughs> and we can try to go through that. We do have a doc page that kind of says what to do when you're trying to recover your system. Uh, so that's on the docs. Um, so hopefully those steps work now. If they don't, please do open a bug. Could you pull up um, and share the docs page for that? Just that might be a good segue here. Um, sure. And then there's a bigger question. There's always a bigger question, a less technical question, but um, I'll throw it out there now because um, one of our guests did um, earlier. And there we go. Perfect. Thank you. So it's about um, the relationship between RHEL, CentOS, and Fedora. And um, you knew we would get one of these questions, and I um, figured that. So question from Fedora, RHEL, and CentOS, he knows that Fedora is upstream with the latest features, whereas RHEL is the stable enterprise version and CentOS is the stable free version, which leads many leads to many enterprises appreciating CentOS for stability. How does Fedora CoreOS fit into this pattern? I want to take that, Dusty, and we can have a conversation about that and maybe uh, also incorporate a little bit about um, CentOS Stream and what that might be. They might not be familiar with that. Okay. Yeah. Um, trying to think of the best way to answer this question. Obviously, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways to answer it, but in general, uh, we have Fedora CoreOS. We try to do everything upstream there. Um, RHEL CoreOS actually follows very closely with the development that's going on in, in Fedora CoreOS, um, you know, with a slight package set tweak that includes things that are specific to OpenShift, like uh, the or like Cryo and you know the container runtime there. Um, so it's a little bit different than normal Fedora to RHEL. It's kind of like the set of packages is the traditional Fedora to RHEL, except for some of the packages that we focus on more like Ignition and things like that, which kind of get updated a little faster. As far as CentOS goes, right now we don't we don't have any plans to make a CentOS core OS, mainly because um, you know it's taking all of our efforts just to work on Fedora core OS. Uh, but I do know some people have expressed interest in that, especially in the OKD working group, um, you know, making essentially a CentOS version uh, that OKD can run on top of. 
but I don't have any plans for that right now. Um, was the question specifically for plans re related to it, or how does you know how does it fit in? Our guest, um, whom I'm going to unmute, see if he can do this. He's on mobile device, so it might not make might not be able to follow up on that. But um, I know we've had a lot of conversations about this in the OKD working group, and we have Christian and Vadim with us from that as well. Um, a lot of it has to do with resourcing, you know, uh, and there is in the CentOS world um, a PAS, a PAS working group where that conversation has been taking place. Um, so Christian, if you want to chime in a little bit, see if we can hear you. I can see you now. Yeah. I can hear you now. Can you, can you hear me too? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, the reason we chose Fedora uh, for OKD as a starting point is um, because we get that uh, that feedback loop, and we, we actually complete a feedback loop um, by having um, changes, yeah, trickle down naturally because Fedora is the upstream. So everything below that will get those fixes eventually. While CentOS is the end of is the most downstream thing, and anything that gets fixed in in CentOS um, isn't landing anywhere else. So CentOS is essentially a repackaging of RHEL. So even in the standard CentOS. Um, if anything is fixed in CentOS first, it doesn't really land in, in RHEL naturally. Um, so for us, it was just, we, and that was kind of broken in the OKD 3.x releases because that was also just a repackaging of OpenShift. So we really wanted to make sure that we get, um, yeah, a, a feedback cycle um, working where uh, any, any bugs we hit in upstream uh, will also be fixed downstream. Um, so I think uh, from a Red, Red Hat perspective, it, it may make sense to also create a CentOS stream um, based core OS um, that would run OKD. I'm not sure we will invest any resources into, um, our, at least not ourselves, into creating a, a CentOS, CentOS, uh, CentOS core OS uh, OKD, which would be, again, it would be downstream and no other none of the other products would sort of benefit from it. Um, yeah, I, th I think, I think, what? go ahead, Colin, sorry. Yeah, just one, one aspect to this I think is really interesting is containers fundamentally change how we think of the operating system. So in this whole conversation, we've been talking about the host. And for some people, that's important. But like all, you can run the Rally UBI container on Fedora Core OS, right? And not only can you, you should. Right, like that's a totally normal and expected thing to do. So for application developers, like you don't have to, you still get the benefit of RHEL and, and the CentOS stability for your app stream. Well, you know, newer hardware enablement and all that stuff comes in in Fedora Core OS, and that's only that only impacts the system administrator. But, um, yeah, so I think that that split is is really important. I think that, um, that one of the very early slides that um, Dusty put up was about um, where the, the container Linux and the Project Atomic project came to live was in the Fedora world. So collaborating with them um, made sense for the OKD working group um, in terms of stability and in um, resourcing the, the effort. So um, that's been, yeah. from, from the working group's perspective, it's been a really nice relationship building period so yeah another thing like the uh, on the resourcing front like with atomic host um you know it was kind of more of a you know a lot more passive relationship with fedora where we would build the same package set that's in fedora we essentially only have one um one stream uh, in, in the terms of uh what we're doing with fedora core os so it was a lot more passive and a lot lower, a lot less resources required. Now we have three streams. We kind of need to keep up with uh, features that are in Next versus the other two. We need to, you know, triage bugs that are against ones versus the others. When we do automatic update rollouts, we need to kind of focus on, you know, did this update break anything? Does it need to be rolled back? Right. So. That's why it was a lot easier to do a CentOS atomic host and Fedora atomic host because it, it was a lot less resource intensive, um, but because we wanted to focus on automatic updates, uh, you know, 
we needed to put some of this other stuff in place. And that's why, you know, when people talk about doing a CentOS core OS, it's like, oh man, that's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> but we, you know, we want to enable people to do that if, right. if people want to step up and, and do that. So it, we would love for it to happen. It's just a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it is, it's, it's a lot of work, um, but I think the pattern has been established and a lot of the, the, the difficult hoops have been figured out. It's, it really truly is a matter of um, uh, resourcing, I think, um, and if the community wants to step up, I'm you know, happy to help drive that as well, but I think it's, um, it really comes down to that. And I think as Colin so aptly put out, containers changed everything. So uh, that would be that. Um, and let's see, I'm gonna go back up. There was another question from Paris Lucas from YouTube. What is the status of the FCAUSE OpenShift Code Ready container? Boy, we've talked about that one a lot in the uh, working group, Christian. And um, tried, tried a couple of things. You wanna, wanna give a... So um, I think Vadim may, may know more about this, but I think we've been able to build it and there is sort of a preview, uh, well, or a um, yeah, proof of concept that it works. Uh, we haven't been able to actually uh, change the project to build on, uh, on top of OKD um, by default as opposed to OCP. So there's still some discussion whether we want that, whether we want to uh, keep that um, ARCOS OCP, OpenShift, um, CoverShift platform based, uh, or switch it over to OKD, or maybe do both, which is, again, work uh, we, haven't, we haven't tackled yet. Uh, so technically it's possible, and uh, we have some, um, some guides to, for um, similar things like uh, OneNote installations of OKD already. Um, so there, there is definitely uh, some discussions that are going on. Yeah, so, the, um, so this is, an AMA around Fedora Core OS, and we we had one the week before on OKD Working Group. But if you want to join the OKD Working Group, there's a whole thread about um, the single node cluster. A whole bunch of people who've done some home lab stuff and some really great stuff. But it has not filtered down into an official code ready container yet. Vadim, I think you can if you should be unmuted now if you have anything to add to that. Right from the technical part. We built an OKD-based DRC bundle, and now it's the team deciding which way do they want to go, the CRC team deciding which way do they want to go. And it's really a hard choice because the OKD features are not that important in code ready containers. Yeah. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that because the difference is really, is just the basis or do they want to go with Fedora CoreOS or RHEL CoreOS? And it's up to them to decide which, what's best for their product. Yeah. So the, there's nothing that keeps us from creating something similar on the community side, other than I'm always going to say the word resources um, and, and maintaining it once you build it. Because um, we've all been there before creating VMs for the early origin that we had to maintain with every release as a community thing. It was fun. Um, and keep me up to date is a, is a thing. Um, and uh, also, we've been having a conversation in the OKD working group about um, uh, ARM64 architectures. And where and Ryan's asking any news about Fedora IoT and the new provision site looks really nice and interesting. But maybe you could talk a little bit about the roadmap or the visioning for Fedora IoT and Fedora CoreOS. <laughs> Everybody just sure. nods. It's like, yeah. yeah, so uh, I know we do, like I mentioned earlier in the slides, we do have a plan to have uh, an ARCH64, uh, you know, stream or set of streams for uh, that platform. Uh, we don't have that just yet. I don't think we have any official plans to you know, merge Fedora Core OS or F Fedora IoT together. I think there's some slightly different goals there. Uh, one of them being Fedora IoT obviously plans to run on uh, some 32-bit ARM hardware, and that is not really a goal that we had from the outset because we're focused a little more on, um, you know, servers. AR64 just seemed like a good line in the sand to draw. 
Um, but yeah, we don't, I don't think we have any official plans for kind of merging the efforts, but that is something to, you know, talk about and explore. We're also always interested in, you know, how to make things better. Um, somebody else might be able to speak to this better than me. Uh, that would probably be Peter Robertson, and or Robinson rather, and so we'll have uh, an AMA on Fedora IoT sometime soon and make him come and talk. Uh, but I, I think that's people. There's also a little confusion out there in the marketplace and and I think uh, or in the community space around that. But it, I think you know, as as others have said, ARM is 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 becoming ubiquitous out there in the IoT land and it comes up often. So I think that's that's there um, from YouTube. Um, back to that hardware question from Vivian. For the hardware question again, I mean, not only installing a pre-configured RAID volume, but also configuring RAID levels from ignition con configuration. At the moment, it's possible to do that for, I'm going to say that acronym wrong, MD admin only, and not for hardware RAIDs. Yeah, that, that, that might be something where we need like a specific issue to dig into, but um... Basically, I guess they're asking for support for Ignition to be able to configure hardware RAID controllers. Uh, yeah, that seems slightly out of scope. I guess there's like typically a tool that is shipped to, to talk to them, or maybe there's a kernel interface that already exists. But yeah, I think maybe a specific issue, I think her name was Vivian, um, would be good, and we can kind of hash out some details there. Uh, I can link to... Um, the issue tracker for Fedora Core OS, and we can kind of take it from there, I think. If you could share your screen and go there, that would be great, because um, that person is not in the blue jeans. Okay, perfect. And then, and they would see where the issue tracker is. Let's go back to the presentation. Um, and I have a slide for getting involved. Uh, so if you want to go just grab Fedora Core OS or view our releases, we have the top level get fedora.org slash core OS. Uh, for any issues or kind of design discussion uh, related stuff, we usually open tickets in our Fedora core OS tracker. So that's github.com slash core OS slash fedora dash core OS dash tracker. Um, so you can open an issue there and that's where we can kind of dig into the details uh, of the hardware RAID controller support. Um, and we also have a forum if you have kind of like a more of a user related question related to you know i can't how do you set a password or things like that um the forum's a good place for that we have a mailing list and we also have fedora core os on freenode should i go to the issue tracker diane or is no, this good go for, just go for a quick quick ride over there to fedora land all right so this is kind of our issue tracker where we try to triage things and it's got everything from you know actual bugs to let's discuss things right so here's something about how do we want to integrate with uh the dusty, you know, we're still just seeing your slide so maybe you have two, uh, okay two, two, hold two, on two, one second split screen personality yeah let's see if we can i think does this look better that's it there you go okay yeah sorry it, it popped up, popped open a new window when i clicked on that link that was not shared um, so yeah, so this is the issue tracker and we kind of have everything in here from actual bugs to discussion topics. So this particular one is uh, where we're chatting about how we want the OKD release schedule and the Fedora Core OS release schedule to uh, relate to one another. Should they be related? Should they not be related? How do, how do we want to go about it? So a little bit of everything in there. And one of the, the guests is um, asking, and, and I think you had a slide on it already, um, uh, is Fedora Core OS already usable in Azure, AWS, GCP, and elsewhere? I think there was a slide. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so if you go to um, you go to our download page, uh, so there are two regions or two clouds in which we have automatically up uploaded images right now. Those are AWS and GCP, and we're trying to work on other ones. However, uh, we also have images created for a lot of different clouds. So we have Alibaba, AWS, Azure, DigitalOcean, Exascale, GCP, OpenStack, and a few others. Um, we also have VMware images. 
Uh, but in general, if you go to our doc site um, and you click on uh, the provisioning machines breakout, you can see how to actually provision a machine on uh, a lot of different cloud providers that we have. So, for example, you asked about Azure. On Azure, because we're not currently uploading directly to Azure, or at least we're not able to share an image that others can use, uh, we show you how to download it and then upload it um, before you start to launch an instance. So if we don't have it automatically uploading, uh, we hopefully have steps for, to show you how to do that. Thank you for that. And thank you for all the effort that you guys have obviously put into making this happen everywhere because it's making a lot of OKD people very happy. Um, and hopefully when we get to GA, we'll have a lot more um, feedback on some of this. See if we've gotten everybody's questions answered. Can um, can you talk for me a little bit about Ignition 3 support versus Ignition 2 support? I know that's been something um, that we've had a conversation with in, in the working group about um, having it there. Can, where, where is Ignition at right now in terms of Fedora Core OS? Uh, oh, I, I can, yeah. or Dusty, take it. No, I'll, I'll let you take it, Christian. The TLDR is, it's very close, uh, and Christian's been working on it very hard. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, in, in Fedora CoreOS, uh, we started with uh, Ignition v3 uh, from the get-go. So uh, that's always been v3 in, in Fedora CoreOS. In Red Hat CoreOS and, and OpenShift um, Compute Platform, we started out with uh, ignition configs back v2 and um, now in the upcoming release 4.6 uh, we will switch uh, ocp to ignition spec v3 as well so it'll be the same and if you're a user of okds um, just use uh, spec v 3.1 and uh, you'll be good and it'll, yeah, OCP will switch to v3.1 as well in the future. And Vadim is pointing out that I... Dusty had shown the machine config pool screen, which had shown both Ignition Spec 2 and Ignition Spec 3 machine configs. Yeah, that was, we, we kind of had a, in the MCO, uh, we added dual support so we can provide either one and it'll be translated um, to Spec 3.1 uh, for OKD and 2.2 for OCP. Um, so just to uh, facilitate that uh, migration for OCP to move from spec 2 to v3. But that's really an implementation detail, and OKD users should always be using um, spec 3 or spec 3.1, and um, that should be fine. I think I'll just add on top of this is we're really close to fixing a lot of, like building on top of a whole lot of infrastructure that we spent the last like two years or so uh, building. And uh, there's a whole lot of new features coming in Ignition around, I, th I think Dusty may have briefly mentioned this around, you know, managing the root file system and a whole bunch of and encryption and a whole bunch of other stuff that uh, I think a lot of people will really appreciate. So this is all kind of coming together now that we have Spec3 supported by KD and, and will be used by Arcos too. It's interesting to watch um, the, the resources or the people um, who are working on all the different projects here. And, and Christian seems to have his finger in just about every patch here um, out there. So it's, it's quite useful having you on the OKD team as well as watching all of this other stuff. Mike Roachford asked a question. Um, I'm not sure we answered it. Um, but in terms of OSs and use, how or would you create a split between RHEL's UBI-based images and the builder templates and those derived from Fedora? He's trying to figure out the best way to even phrase the question. So um, does that make sense to folks? Could you repeat the question? It's, it's in the chat as well, and I think he's still with us, so maybe he can, Mike, if you want to uh, unmute, you can clarify that. Not to put you on the spot, but yeah, to put you on the spot. But are Fedora container images a goal for OKD? 
Um, so I think it's a secondary goal for us to um, obviously um, build out that Fedora container ecosystem. So in the future, the OKD working group, we've already talked about this last week, will meet up with the Fedora container SIG. Um, and yeah, obviously we're interested in, in delivering all of our operators on, on Fedora containers as well. Um, it also works the way it is now with um, UBI-based containers or CentOS-based containers. Uh, but obviously, yeah, we, we do want to uh, encourage people to, to build uh, Fedora containers and use Fedora containers for everything. Uh, someone asked me earlier today um, in Slack about the uh, o um, OCP's operators, the operators that weren't in operator hub.io yet. Um, and if and there's a few. There's a few um, operators that are specific to the operator hub that comes with um, OpenShift Container Platform. And if we were, we, the working group, was going to rebuild all of those on Fedora CoreOS. And I think that's a bit of a significant effort. And I think it's also um, some other, other questions around that as well. Um, which ones? And I think it's specifically they were talking about Service Mesh and Istio, making sure that there was one-to-one um, -one parity with what is available on operatorhub.io. Yeah. Um, as far as like rebuilding things on Fedora images, I think that would be, it would be great to have, but uh, you know, a question to have is, or a question to think about is like, is there a trade-off uh, for doing that work? Is there other work that we, sh you know, should do instead? If, for example, that was going to push the OKD GA out to January of next year, would that be something we'd want to do? Um, and the other thing, too, is, you know, if things are able to use a UBI base and we have only one version of them, it's a lot easier to maintain. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just like there's a lot of trade-offs to think about when you start to go down that road, which is the exact same thing, um, which we – we're discussing earlier with a Fedora core OS and a CentOS core OS, right? It's resources often are the limiting factor, um, but we want to do things and we want to get more involvement from the community as well to help us achieve those goals. Yeah. One thing that uh, may be related to Itzio is this uh, concept of host dependent containers, because I think Itzio ends up programming IP tables and things like that. And so that is a tricky, topic to handle. Um, we have some discussions around that, around how you best have a container that, you know, partially executes on or manages the host, but hopefully we can get to the point where even these host dependent containers like it's, you know, work in both cases without needing to be rebuilt. Yeah. So I think... Yeah, and I think the first step we're going to do here is just building those containers that aren't currently publicly available without a subscription that are rel based uh, building them, uh, rebuilding them in Fedora, just to have feature parity uh, with the community version. I don't think you, we don't, yeah, we don't have to rebuild all the UBI8 containers because uh, there's just no benefit to it, really. Yeah, I think that that'll that'll be good, um, and that might be a good way of doing it. Getting parity is is what we want, um, and then you know, if third parties want to go and build something out there and host it in Operator Hub.io. God bless them. If the working group, either the OKD or the Fedora Core OS or some other working group, um, the Fedora Container um, working group decides to take on that, um, then bless them and uh, find the resource. I think that the really what we're just trying to do today, and um, I think Dusty's got another talk on Community Central this week, and we're going to be doing a lot of talking around OKD4, is really getting the word out about how to engage with these communities, how to test the, the work that we're doing, and give us your feedback on um, Fedora Core OS. Um, make sure that the cadence of release cycles and stable releases are working for everybody, um, and that we all stay in sync and connected on these things. So it's um, it, and and we recruit new bodies to continue to do uh, more work. So I think that's really been there. Um, in terms of the roadmap for Fedora Core OS, Dusty and Colin, what what's next? Uh, <laughs> so I would say we've got a few issues that are kind of you know 
periodically come up that we're trying to work on next. I mentioned one earlier, which was uh, multi-arch. So we have, you know, some very motivated people in the community that kind of maintain a secondary pipeline uh, for uh, different architectures. And we want to make that like part of our official pipeline, right? So we want to try to release stable for, you know, all architectures at the same time. We want to have the artifacts show, to, show up on our download page. We want to have them signed by Fedora Release Engineering, like our current 64-bit um, Intel uh, artifacts are. So that's something we're going to try to work on next. Um, we mentioned complex root device stuff that's in the works right now. Uh, we're always doing something around networking, it feels like. Um, so we're trying to enhance it so that, for example, right now we default to DHCP when you first bring up a node, um, which is a same default, but in some cases it can be problematic. Um, so we're going to try to change it so that if you don't actually need DHCP on that first boot, uh, we're going to not not bring it up, right? Um, let's see, what else? Oh, so even though we discourage package layering in Fedora Core OS, sometimes uh, it is advantageous to do that uh, for maybe some small feature that's like a host level type thing uh, that is just not very easy to containerize or either a very big maintenance burden to containerize. Um, so we're going to try to make package layering more reliable. We've had this problem for a long time with our OS tree based distros, Silverblue, Atomic Host, Fedora Core OS. So we're going to try to tackle that problem on the Fedora release engineering and infrastructure side and see if we can help that out a little bit. So a lot of small things, cloud providers, you know, if you're a cloud provider and you want Fedora Core OS running on you, we would love to have, make that happen. Um, so yeah, just more of the same for right now. Uh, obviously OKD is just now getting to GA, but we want the relationship with OKD to be tighter, right? So we've been doing a lot of foundational work in Fedora Core OS, haven't had a lot of time, you know, Christian and Vadim have done an amazing job without a lot of help from us, <laughs> right? And we want to make sure that that integration is better, right? We also want to look at other Kubernetes distros like Kubernetes distros like Typhoon who are also using Fedora Core OS underneath, right? How can we be a better platform for them? So those are the types of things that we're looking at, you know, in the short to midterm. Perfect. Well, I think it's um, it's a great relationship. I think we're just going to have to foster more of them um, in the coming uh, months and weeks and days um, and move, move it forward. If you want to throw back up your final slide with how to get a hold of everybody, that might be a great way to end. And um, we'll definitely have you guys back on um, and continue to collaborate with you uh, across lots of different communities. So thank you all for joining and um, we look forward to many more releases in tandem with OKD and others. Definitely, thanks thank you all. All right, thank you all for joining. Take care today.